In the search for safe yet lucrative places to put your money, many people seem to be choosing the art market, especially if you look at some of the prices that have been paid recently. Our guest today can tell us more about that market because he insures it. Ulrich Guntram is the CEO of AXA Art. Welcome to NCAD Knowledge. Who is actually buying art today? We have seen some crazy prices. Roy Lichtenstein for $43 million in early November at Christie's in New York. That seems to be rather unusual. Who's buying these pieces? Last year, an important thing happened. Namely, China became the number one demand for art insurance, for art, which means we always had the US, the first market, then London, and then other European countries. Now we have the US number one, China number two, and the UK number three. So that's a strong indicator that Asia is also on the rise of the art market. Lots of the international auctions are fueled by Chinese Asian money, money coming from other emerging markets. So the new art buyers are to a large extent people who have made it, who have liquidity and who are using art not only to enjoy it or to build a collection, but they are also buying art to get social standard and social prestige. There seems to be a desire today for people to invest in something secure but with growth potential. Is art that kind of a market? People are investing heavily into art because they don't know where to put it elsewhere. Is it a safe place? Well, it's extremely volatile. It's probably one of the most volatile investments. Does it deliver a good return? That depends. It depends in which segment of the art market you invest. It depends on the transaction costs. Usually transaction costs in the art market are between 50 and 30 percent. So that all has to be factored in. How does this translate into demand for insurance? Well, when the art market as today is on the rise and growing double digit a year, my chairman is asking me, why the hell are you not growing 40% this year? And why aren't you? Well, because the art insurance market is lagging in the emerging art markets with quite some time span. This can be up to 10 years. The reason is very simple. People are buying art, but they don't see any reason why to insure it, even in the established art markets like the US and UK. What can be insured? If I go out and spend $10,000 on a painting to hang in my house, what am I actually insuring? The art insurance is probably the most powerful and most comprehensive insurance at all. We sell all risk insurance, which means basically, as the term says, everything is insured. There are very, very few exceptions. War, for example, is not insured. Usually, uh, damages coming from dirty bombs is not insured. Terror is insured, and the inherent aging in a work of art, so if the material becomes uh, fragile, if it's an inherent process, this is what is not insured. Basically everything else is insured. It's damage, it's theft, if you lose it, uh, even loss in value, all these things are insured. You mentioned deteriorating or aging materials. Now, painters like Rembrandt made their own oil paints. They've lasted 400 years, but today there's acrylic, there's plastic. That's not meant to last. How do you insure that? Well, we have no problem at all insuring plastic and acrylic paints. Um, we have, by the way, sponsored quite some research projects on acrylic paint and plastic as a raw material for artworks. Um, you, you have to be aware what are the inherent aging processes for plastic, for example, which is completely different than bronze, wood, or linen, the old materials. Plastic, our assumption is, is a material which lasts forever, and that's so wrong. Plastic relatively quickly deteriorates, and you just need to be aware of that and factor it into your risk assessment as an insurer, but we insure it. Some of the newer markets that you've mentioned are more conservative. They may be more prone to censorship. How does this affect the growth of the art market and then how does it affect your business? Art needs freedom. So if there is no 
freedom to express yourself, it certainly affects the art and it certainly affects the art, the, at least the local art market. Yes, there are countries where um, the art market is by far not as developed as it could be because of the political circumstances. I personally believe this is a question of time, as we see it now in some Arabian countries. We have also had the same experience here in Germany. We had the totalitarian um, socialist system in Eastern Germany, the GDR. Was that an art market? I'm not aware of it. But the interesting thing is when the wall, the Berlin Wall, did came down 21 years ago, there was a lot of art um, suddenly coming to the surface, which was produced under the censorship. And now it's even on the market. So I, I believe art needs freedom and it will break through. It's just a question of time. How do you attract clients in new markets, particularly markets where there's no tradition of insuring property? Entering these new markets, these new art insurance market is pretty much always a similar pattern. We start with exhibitions and that has little to do with the art market. Um, exhibitions usually follow the exchange of good. They follow the trade. So as we have a globalized world where the exchange of goods is an everyday um, thing, the exhibitions, the exchange of cultural goods is following. So currently we have an immense travel of exhibitions from Europe going to China and the other way around, for example. Or we also have it with the Arab countries. So exhibitions are the first thing to be insured. The next step is there are shippers, warehouses, there are galleries, auction houses who are dealing with the art. That's usually the next step. They need insurance. They need to protect their businesses. And usually the last one is the collector. The art insurance market seems to have become commoditized. How is that affecting your business and your business model? The art insurance market in some segments is indeed commoditized. And there are several forces at work. I'm in that business personally since more than 10 years. I have seen in these 10 years prices only falling down. For insurance? For art insurance. In the art insurance business for big exhibitions, each year the prices are falling double digit, each year. So what we have seen 10 years ago in terms of price for a collection today is a fraction. Why is this? It is because to a large extent the general property insurance companies who have no interest at all to get after the art they are not growing anymore in their um, ordinary markets. So they are now pushing into the niches and art is one of them. So they are throwing capacity into our segment. So if you are fighting against large property insurance companies as a specialty niche player, you have to make up your mind, how do you survive in a niche, as a niche player in a market which is basically commoditized. And how do you do that? Well, we believe there are good ways to do so. First of all, we are looking for sub-niches. So, you know, we are getting into the smaller holes where the big cat can't follow. Um, and there are nice sub-niches. For example, we have enlarged our um, spectrum of business from traditional art to all sort that people collect seriously. We ensure the term now is passion assets. Everything people spend their money with some passion that can be luxury goods, it can be classic cars, can be musical instruments, um, antiques, rare books, a variety of these things. So we are creating our own sub niches. Another way is you need to differentiate yourself. We have to be competitive on price. We have to be competitive on terms and conditions with the big players. But then we have to go beyond. We don't want to be the cheapest. We differentiate because we offer not only a cover, we offer um, protection in a broad sense, prevention. If something is stolen, we don't give up until it is recovered and the painting is hanging on the wall again. 
If something is damaged, we don't give up and just pay. We look for the best restorer to bring the damaged good back into a close to initial condition. Um, and the third element we try hard is to give our business a human face. I think the least a big collector wants to have is calling the insurance company and ending up in a call center. Prices for art are going up, your premiums are going down. What happens if you have a big payout to make? How do you actually function as a small to medium-sized enterprise in this global market? Well, that's the real challenge being an art insurance player. We carry on our balance sheet probably something between 150 and 200 billion euros cross exposure. That depends on the number of exhibitions. That's a huge, huge number. So no company can cover this with equity. This means we have to be extremely accurate in our exposure management. We have to know where are our hotspots in terms of accumulation. So we have to trace each and every object that we insure basically around the world to make sure if they come together, for example, in an exhibition at an art fair uh, or at an airport, that we keep control of the total exposure. And then we have probably one of the most powerful reinsurance programs in the industry. You mentioned art theft. Do you work with Interpol? Well, we work with Interpol, with the Scotland Yard, if it's necessary, with the FBI. But we also work with a variety of um, some selected private detectives. If there is a theft, then usually these thefts are of an international nature, which means um, it's, we just had two, two and a half years ago a theft of two German Picassos, which were lent to a museum in Switzerland. They were stolen there and they ended up in Serbia. So we had to deal with two police institutions in two cantons in Switzerland, with the Serbian police and with the German police. That's impossible to coordinate and get them aligned. So we worked with all four of them. Each and every step we did was approved by the state prosecutors. But in the, from the very beginning, a private detective who was working under our mandate was working on the case and in the end he relocated and recovered the two Picassos. And I'm happy just a week ago we could hand it back to the museum in Hanover in Germany. What kind of training do you need to go into this business? The interesting thing in our business is you can go very far with a good common sense. If you think a claim through from the very beginning, what did happen step by step, little by little, what could have gone wrong? You come very far. The same in risk assessment. If we are confronted with a huge exhibition, a, a huge exposure, if you just thoroughly think through what can happen, what are the preconditions that we have to take, what are the measures, security measures we have to take, you can get very far. And then you have to realize, where is my competence not sufficient, and get the right partner, and pull in a real expert, and orchestrate a network. I think we are, as a mid-sized company, extremely networked, not only within the AXA empire, but globally in the art world, and with a lot of professional companies. You, we, we are the spider in a network of professionals who are dealing with the art from very different angles. And can you learn that at business school? I think so. So if you want to have fun, if you want to, to build a business in an extremely dynamic and growing market globally, this is the place to be. Let's look at the financial art market for a minute, funds that invest in art. What's your assessment of this market and what's your relationship to it? From an insurance point of view, this is ambivalent. On the one hand, we are happy that there's a new market on the other hand, somebody who is buying art for the purpose of investment has a different mindset, a different relationship to the work of art than a collector who has the whole heart, his whole emotion and passion behind this piece of art, which for me as an insurance company is the best reinsurance. 
Now, if somebody is just investing and just looking for the return, that's a different relationship. So for us, it's extremely important to precisely understand what is the intention of the investor. If it is an institu institutional investor, for example, an art fund, what is the business model behind? We are doing a thorough due diligence on these art funds, on our institutional clients to understand what is the business model and how do we share the risks together? Is this balanced or is it biased? Am I carrying all the risks or is the partner in the same boat with me? What's your view of the economy today? And we have debt crises, we have the euro crisis. What do you see in your crystal ball? I have no crystal ball. Personally, I'm, I'm really worried about the debt crisis, not only with the euro. I think we also have a huge debt crisis with the dollar. On the investment side, we have been very, very conservative since more than 10 years. Because the nature of our insurance business is so volatile, so highly exposed, we tried to avoid any other source of volatility in our business. So we have not gone into derivatives, we have not gone even into equities. We just insured in very boring papers. I had no impairments over the last three years. Um, and we still make a nice um, fixed income return on our invested book. Now, that's the good side. The, the problem is, and that one I share with all my other colleagues in the insurance industry, um, we have problems to reasonably invest our liquidity. Um, if, you, if you want to get a bit more than just one and a half or two percent, where do you invest these days? In terms of the general economy, um, well, we are in a very high-end uh, segment which is affected by the crisis, but much less than, for example, the majority of uh, the economy and uh, the soci society. The luxury in industry is affected, but it's much more robust, and the art industry is part of the luxury industry. Let me end by asking you your views on your own business. What keeps a smile on your face? Um, this business has developed with the art insurance business with such a past, fast pace. Um, each and every year we see new challenges, new opportunities. The competitive environment has completely changed. Five years ago we were in a comfortable niche. The big players were not interested in this. It was too small, it was too sophisticated, it was unknown. Now everybody wants to get a piece of each and every little niche. So the level of competition has dramatically increased. But the market, the art market, is also growing worldwide. But there are also, in the established markets, interesting new segments. What we discussed earlier, the financial industry, which is now getting into art, whether it's art as an investment, art as a collateral, or the financial industry which is trying to make a margin whenever there's a transaction of art. All these things are interesting for us. We have the phenomenon of the so-called young collector, people who are buying art, who are driving the art market, not because they intend to build up a collection, they just buy art for a variety of motivations because they have empty walls at home, they enjoy the art, um, they have excess money, whatever the reason is. So, I think we are blessed with opportunities. We are challenged with a lot of new difficulties. So it will remain a thrilling place. Ulrich Guntram, thank you very much for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you.